We're back, and um, I want to uh, introduce our next guest, Oscar Munoz is here. Oscar, of course, the CEO of United Airlines. Come on out, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I don't have any planned mergers. No planned mergers no. at the moment? Um, we'll see whether this interview is easier or harder than the last. Um, and there's a lot to talk about in the aviation business and a lot of concerns about the aviation business and, and where it's all headed and everybody wants to understand both the opportunities and the challenges. Uh, but I actually do want to start in what uh, may be a hard place, I don't know. Um, and it was one of the reasons I, I wanted to sit with you here, uh, which is you have gone on uh, a pretty uh, remarkable journey over this past year uh, as a CEO, uh, in large part because there was an event that became a social media event um, when a passenger was dragged off of that plane. And when that happened, there was a reaction from the company under your name, and then there was a massive reaction from the public. And I, I wanted to just start, if you could just take us a little bit for a moment inside the room, to the extent that there's a lesson learned in all of this. Uh, we have a number of CEOs and other leaders here and I imagine we all read about this situation and this experience, uh, but we haven't had the opportunity to hear it directly from you. Well, it's good to start there. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a very different world. The event as it unfolded should have never happened, and that is on, on me and us, and, and I think we've, uh, we've talked about that a lot. As we've dissected all the events, all the circumstances, um, the, the key learnings are such you know, as you say, in the room, I think one of the key learnings that I project out to folks, because we're all at some point in time could be affected by this, is that you have more time to respond than you think. The initial response that I gave under my name was wrong, period. I own that. It was, a, it was a, one of those moments where you felt compelled to respond quickly as it was escalating on social media. And you just think that your, your gut was off? I mean, it, people called it a, a non-apology apology. Yes. It was a combination, as always it tends to be, of a mixture of of folks in your ear telling you what to say. And so what ended up being um, an unapologetic apology, exactly. It was not what I felt, certainly, and I should have gone with my gut instinct. And at the end of the day, when you sit in the offices that we sit on, there's no one behind you. And so what I felt, what I saw, I should have said so and moved forward from that perspective. And that was probably the biggest learning in that regard. And in terms of not just the, the, the early reaction, I'm afraid to say there was a secondary reaction uh, that the public also felt uh, did not go far enough. And that was the one when I supported my employees. And as it, wrong as I got the first one, I'll tell you and I'll tell it to I'm, I'm done. The second one, I got right. There was only one United employee effectively involved in the whole process. It was not their fault. We let the policies and procedures of a mega operating safety oriented organization like an airline, we let those policies and procedures get in the way of simple human values, right? No one should be treated like that. And that I own, that wasn't my employees and my, uh, in essence, shout out to our folks was just to let them know that it's not your fault, you're doing the right things all the time, let me take this one. Let me ask you a question about supporting employees because your, your employees, we should note, are hugely supportive of you very, very interesting, actually. Um, Why is it interesting? No, 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 no. no. Nice guy. <laughs> g g no, to g g given your support of, of them. But uh, in that moment, to, and it, it's a hard thing because you have multiple constituencies that you're working with, um, and, but there was the, the, the government in all of this, meaning there, there, the, the, the people who dragged those people off the plane didn't technically work for you. And I'm curious why you didn't say something about that. Not to deflect blame onto them, but to address it head on. You know, human principle and integrity is a sort of a deep thing. And I think one of the turnaround aspects of, of United has been about recapturing the hearts and minds and energizing, uh, re-energizing and recommitting 90,000 people all over the globe. And prior to that event, we had made a lot of progress in re-engaging our workforce. And I'd done that by a lot of genuine trust and conversation with a lot of them. For them to see me in a moment of crisis quickly do what others would do, meaning blame someone else, it was not something I was going to do, even in my own personal detriment. And I think that's the 
fundamentally basic view that I have of me that said I'm not going there because inevitably I need 90,000 uh, folks taking care of you every time you fly. And I want their heart in it. I want them engaged in that process. And if they don't trust me in a moment of crisis, they can easily say something like, you know what, he's just like the rest of them. And I didn't want that to happen. Uh, the larger issue this brought up, and it's not just a United issue, but it's a, it's a broad issue, is customer service in the airline business. And invariably, uh, the report, everybody came out and said, you know what, this is just a, a microcosm of the problem that, that customers face uh, on airplanes. And it's the worst example of it. Um, but why do you think we all have this impression? Nobody <laughs> likes to go to the airport. And, and it's, a, yeah, it's a function of things over time. You know, yesterday I celebrated the uh, final flight of our 747. And uh, all of us as customers and as flying public don't always see those wonderful heroic moments of of pride and, and hearkening back to an old age where air travel was a wonderful thing and you know you were going on vacation and, and all those it's still that way 97 98 percent of the time we you know we fly 146 million customers a year we fly you know seven to nine hundred uh, aircraft are in the air today a huge percentage 97 percent will land safely and effectively but unfortunately, in the law of large numbers, there's always failures. There's delays, there's cancellations, your seat doesn't work, your coffee's not as warm as you'd like it, you don't like the cheese, the coffee, the, the snacks. And so we're all experts in that space, and it's my role, our role as a company, to provide you that comfort and that personalized service that, that, that you so, so desire. But there's exogenous aspects. As I like to say, Mother Nature, weather, is not in our Rolodex. She doesn't work for us. And so you have those things. You have air traffic control and the issues that we face there. And so there's so many exogenous aspects that affect us that we can't control that. And now security is the next uh, wave of, of aspects that affect you. And so we have to figure out different and better ways of making the traveling public feel a little bit more comfortable. Where I think the foundational aspect of what United's going to do differently is that when you finally get through all that morass, through traffic, through parking, through security, when you sit down with us, there needs to be somebody there that's warm and caring and friendly and gives you what you need. And I think that's a big difference. Do you think, though, from a policy perspective, one of the arguments that has been made is that the incentives are all off, that given all the consolidation in the industry, which has been great for the stock prices uh, of, of airlines and the profits of airlines, uh, that the incentive to provide that level of service that we want isn't there. Yeah. it's. Um it's a thin margin business, as we like to say, and it historically has been a negative margin business. And anything you offer um, is always in scale. Um, if you want pretzels on our airline, I think we have 150 million little bags of pretzels manufactured in, I think, seven different locations worldwide, because no one company can do that many. And to your point with regards to the economy, all of that costs money. And you won't fly one airline versus another because of the pretzel or the coffee or the meal. You'll fly because the schedule works and the price is right. And so we have to focus on our network, where we fly, frequency, the kind of aircraft, while providing a uh, sort of an equal level of service that all of the other airlines provide to some degree. Here's a question, and, and I'm, I'm going to get flack for asking it. How much of it is the customer's expectation? And I want to read you something. Nelson Schwartz wrote a front page article at the New York Times. Um, Earlier this year, he quoted a fellow named Alex Dichter, senior uh, partner at McKinsey. And he said, about 35% of customers are choosing on price, and price alone. And another 35% choose mostly on price. The great irony is that most CEOs would love to compete on product and experience. It's much more fun. The problem is that customers aren't paying attention to that. So the solution to that in the technical marketing speak is segmentation. Uh, because that two-thirds of folks that have price in their mindset, you have to provide a product that, that matches what they're looking for. Our trick is to provide that segmentation in a more cost-effective way that allows us to continue to make money. And again, making money, it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be against the law. Uh, you want us flying. You want us offering the services that we do. Uh, but segmentation is a way to, segment, uh, to, to break that up a little. But let me ask you also about the, the pricing issue, because there are, there are hubs and airports in this country, including places like Houston. If you, you can't, if you decide you didn't want to take United, you'd be driving. Well, 
Um, there are certain places in the location where there is a, a bit of a majority of one carrier for another. I think we all occupy those. All the major airlines have places where we call home that tend to be more uh, that, in that way. But I tell you, there's, there's 5,000, at last count, airlines in this planet. And they're all flying. Most of them are flying here at some point in time. So there's plenty of opportunity. There's plenty of option for the right of folks is, is the way we look at it. And it's always been a competitive industry. Um, I asked you about security. You mentioned security. And um, I found a, I remember reading this, and I went back to find it. Um, this fellow named Jason Harrington is a TSA employee, or former employee, I should say. He wrote this in Politico. And he said that security uh, in this country at airports is not security. It's security theater. And when you look at the numbers, it is staggering to appreciate that, for example, the last time this took place in 2015, the TSA, when they actually tested their systems, 95% of the time, and I want to get this right, uh, they were able to sneak in explosive materials, fake weapons, and drugs. What do you, as an airline, think of that and the fact that we're all going through those lines, it's not working, and it's costing you too? Um. It is a difficult subject. And again, it balances the needs of customers and traveling and the stress we mentioned earlier with the absolutely paramount concern with safety, both human and physical, uh, physical assets. Uh, I think our TSA folks, um, within the last administration, the person that we were working with, I thought we had a really good, a very good relationship in talking about the practicality the need for safety, but the need for flow, and more importantly, to make sure that safety was indeed not being compromised in any way, shape, or form. I think there can be continued good partnership between airlines and the security folks to ensure that we don't have that breakdown in the mechanism. But again, they're two separate entities, and we as a, as a private enterprise can only do so much with a governmental agency other than advice and counsel. What have the impact of the quote-unquote extreme vetting efforts um, of the Trump admi administration done to your business? Well, anytime you create any kind of concern or noise to the traveling public, it, it carries widely, whether it's in a particular country, a particular ethnicity, a particular location. Uh, and so, indeed, initially we had some uh, confusion, is really what it was, because nobody knows what they're doing. Do I, can I get back in? Shall I travel to that com country? And so, clarification and us working with the administration post that event was all about can we get a heads up? about the communication so we can at least effectively move you as customers through the security lines in a way that's, that's more uh, efficient. Another policy question um, in terms of international flying, there's a big debate in this country and among the US airlines who have gone to the government to say, look, some of these Middle Eastern carriers uh, are being subsidized in ways that are unfair. On the other side, there are people who say that you are actually trying to uh, create uh, more profits unfairly. <laughs> I'm not sure where to get that one, but uh, no, the, the issue with the gold carriers is that they're not airlines. They're the argument they're, being that you just that you that you don't want to consider. Sure, sure, no. Oh no, we compete extensively across all areas, and you can see our stock price for decades about why that pricing mechanism and the competitiveness is such a sometimes a little bit of a drag on our equities. But with regards to the gold carriers, I think the concern is simply is it the one that they're not airlines. They are international branding vehicles for those countries and our state not partly subsidized, but subsidized in a significant way. The economists have roll, you know, rolled up some numbers that say over the last decade, I believe the number is 50 billion in subsidies provided to these airlines to fly. They don't fly very full, they're very expensive aircraft, so the math would hold. There's argument about that number. I've just simply said, being sort of new to the debate in the last couple of years, I said, all right, well, cut it in half. It's still epic in its amount of subsidies provided to any entity. And I've worked with a lot of countries in previous in, uh, organ industries and have seen subsidies at work. And there's a balance where, where it works, but this one is it's at a level that makes it a very unfair competitive playing field. So we're okay with competition, but let's fight on an even keel. And this one certainly is not. The other big debate in Washington right now is the idea of privatizing the FAA. This is something that most of the airlines uh, have uh, gotten behind. There was. Uh, couple of stragglers as well early on. Uh, what are the implications in your mind, both the upside and downside? Because there is an argument on the other one. Well, sure. Listen, first and foremost, the term privatization is a political term. It is not what we're supporting as airlines. We support the simple, simple concept of modernization. 
We're one of the few countries that still have an outdated system. For some of you, and I've read about this, but I don't know, but there's something called an 8-track tape player that used to be around a long time. Yeah. Um, in, in effect, our air traffic control system is of that, of that ilk, of that generation. And to modernize it to a, the iPhone X is, is something what we're trying to do. We think, the pros, is that we think in a, in a, in a private setting, with the right amount of resourcing that's consistent, the right ability to um, attract the right level of uh, developers that can make this happen, I think makes a big difference in getting this thing done. The government, and I love, and the FAA has done a wonderful job with the concerns that they have, but they've had almost a decade, and we have less than 1% flying on that model. Uh, we'd like to take that and accelerate that, because every day we don't, your delays that you, have, you, you suffer are due to some of that. Flying under the new next-gen system, as safe as the current system? People say that the current system uh, may be inefficient, but it's very safe. Yeah, I, I don't think anywhere in this whole stream of consciousness is the term safety or the concept of safety on any, ma any matter or, or system that you have is ever something of a concern. Th th that is the starting point for everything. There is nothing unsafe about anything we're doing today. Um, let me ask you another question just about uh, being a, a CEO in this country, given the conversations we've been having about such a politically divided world, and when it's your role to jump into the political conversation or not. You were born in Mexico, uh, raised in Southern California. And uh, you did jump into the DACA uh, conversation yes, I did. Um, earlier this year. What thought process did you have in terms of either internally talking to board members, other people about whether you wanted to jump into the fray? It's always a delicate point for anyone. I, I do offer a unique perspective other than the fact that I am an immigrant, A, and B, I have a position where I can say things that other people can't say. I have a place where I can say things and people will listen, and it's an important part to me. I have to distinguish between my personal views and opinions and those of the company, and I often do that, as I would do right now. Uh, but in that particular case, I thought of all the things that we were doing, whether in immigration or the wall or those things, um, the concept of, of children, young children, who by no fault of their own are in this country uh, about to do wonderful and great things, like maybe I have had the opportunity to do, to not allow that, I thought was at le reaching a point of ludicrous, and I felt I needed to speak out. And uh, it's good that I think government has heard a little bit, and we pivoted away from that. But, but the, I, I did not check with a lot of folks. Um, what I did is I distinguished my viewpoints from that of the companies. Uh, I have, as much uh, as you could. I have two final questions, and I do want to open up. And I, I know there's a lot of uh, people uh, here who, who travel United who may have questions even about their own membership miles. Um, <laughs> my two questions, uh, one is actually just a very practical one. When is the Wi-Fi going to get really, really great? <laughs> Not soon enough, yes. I, 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 am, I am with you. I'm telling you, I fly our aircraft all the time, and the inconsistencies, we use technical terms like get them in, the technology is, is developing. We'll announce something here in the not-too-distant future that will be the new platform that will be seamless, consistent, and available at all times. Uh, unfortunately, we have hundreds and hundreds of aircraft that have to be retrofitted to provide the new technology, and that is the biggest thing. Scale is difficult, so it'll take us time to work that out. But I think we've finally, technology has come to a place where we have the right solution that allows that. By the way, the, the background on this is we merged two companies who were formerly other companies, and so there was just different platforms. That's an excuse. That's what the issue that we have. We just got to fix that. And uh, some of the newer companies are able to do that because they're newer companies and they have newer aircraft and have had ability to build Greenfield. We've got to work with what we have. Um, but I got you. That's one of the top things on our list is Wi-Fi. And final question from me. We had Dara uh, from Uber up here. And he said, five years from now, flying cars. <laughs> what does that do to your business? Well, and do um, you believe it? I'll tell you two things. One, first of all, from the flying public, we have these wonderful folks called pilots that are very good at what they do today. And you have to remember that. I think the social acceptance of getting in an aircraft uh, without a human piloting, I think, is probably a, a generational issue, uh, is a social acceptance. I think technologically, we have autopilot now that, in essence, can do a lot of what autonomous vehicles will do. And so I think the technology will be here first before we will actually get on an aircraft that we don't have a human behind it. OK, let's uh, open it up uh, for questions. Let's keep the, the, the membership miles. Uh, we'll get you an 800 number for those. Uh, but uh, if there are questions, I, I see one down here. Hi, I'm Griffin. I'm a student uh, actually from Andrew's alma mater, Cornell. 
Um, question that I have, so you mentioned a little bit about autonomous flying. Um, how do you kind of manage that trade-off um, with having your employees and having so many pilots on your payroll and then possibly having that be cut by having autonomous uh, airplanes? Uh, it's, it's what I think I just said. I think the technology will evolve and uh, avail us of that capability. Um, I think our wonderful pilots will be around for a while and there will be no trade-off in the near term. Do you, think, do you actually think that, pilot, that planes will be completely autonomous? Or did you, could you see one pilot up there and one on the ground? Or how? I think there's a combination of all those things in the future somewhere. And I think, again, technology exists today that allows a lot of, uh, a lot of flying. But again, I, I, just, I really do think it becomes the social acceptance. I mean, by a show of hands, who would get in an aircraft today that's not piloted by a human? So there was a group of, of growing, and, and when, I, when I have that and I offer that service, nobody actually takes you up on it, because there are models we can do for that. But so it'll grow. It'll grow over time. Okay, let's take a, a quick final question, uh, if there is one. We have, a, we have another student. Uh, so we hear a lot about the card companies uh, and talks with ride-sharing businesses, but I've always been surprised that an airline has never considered purchasing a ride-sharing company sort of makes sense that you have the same autonomous conversation uh, as transportation. Would you guys ever consider buying um, a ride-sharing business? You know, and we were talking about vertical and horizontal integration uh, from a merger perspective with Randall. Uh, I think what you learn in business and as a student, if you go back in history, um, conglomerates, people that want to go up the food chain and sideways, over time you lose your focus on what's important. I don't think we've solved the transportation by air just yet that wandering off into the Netherlands is probably not appropriate for us at this point in time. We're too big a scale. Now partnering, and Darren and I partner uh, with regards, Uber's a big partner with United. Uh, I see a world, especially in the digital transformation space, where, think about this, we talk about this high-end innovation and technology longer term, but I think of it as relevant technology and innovation today that benefits you as the flying public now, not in the future. And we have enough data about who, who you are, where you fly, and more importantly, over the last period of time, when we've delayed you, canceled you, made you change your seat, spilled coffee on you, we have the points of failure and the points of success. Wouldn't it be great if all of you, as you're traveling home tomorrow or tonight, that we, and we can have the capability very soon to do this, can reach out to you proactively and say, hey, sorry about the last few flights. We've had this uh, the night before. Here's an Uber uh, code for your, your flight tomorrow. We've made sure we've got you upgraded to first class. And by the way, we have a security line that'll be just for you that you can get through. So reduce the stress level based upon the fact that we've not met your satisfaction. That's the kind of innovation and technology and personalization that we have to bring today. And all this wonderful long-term views we work on concurrently, but I think our customers need better service and better personalization today. And that's what we're focusing on, rather than expanding into some of these other uh, aspects because it hasn't worked before. In the same vein, do you ever think there's going to be electric planes? Uh, with regards to, um, you know, there's, there's electric planes now. Uh, can they fly the scope, scale, and missions that we fly internationally? I think technology will evolve to that at some point in time, but I'm not an engineer, so I'm not sure of that at this point. Okay. I think we are out of questions. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Appreciate really it. Really appreciate this conversation. Thank you. That was, ter that was terrific. Thank you.